tuning in about an hour ago. I tried to do this on the road and boy, I just couldn't get any service. So we weren't in the mountains anymore, but sometimes it's just that way. The beauty of being online, right? Anyway, welcome. I am Susan Smith. I am a long arm machine quilter and I'm coming on to my channel, my YouTube channel live every day for 30 days. We're at day 13 and each day is just mm, 10 to 20 minutes of chatting about all kinds of topics that relate to machine quilting and specifically to long arm quilting and just giving you some of my experiences, some of my stories and answering lots of your questions. So I welcome you to write me with any questions or topics that you'd like to see talked about. You can email me info at stitchedbysusan.com and lots of the topics that we have talked about already are in response to some of the questions you've been asking. So if you're enjoying these chats, would you give it a thumbs up? Would you subscribe to the channel? And also if you click the notification bell, that's how YouTube knows to let you know whenever I am coming live. And today I want to talk a little bit about buying a long arm machine for the first time. Now there are sit down long arm machines. That's not really my area of expertise, although some of these things will apply. So take from it what you can if you indeed are looking for a sit down machine. But for the most part, I'll be talking about long arms on frames because that's what I know. So when you're, you're deciding this is your first long arm purchase, I'm assuming. And so you're thinking, you know, what are the questions I should be asking? What are the factors that I want to consider? And I think really high on that list would be price point, just because that's a big consideration for many of us. And also it is a huge variable when it comes to long arm machines. You can find used ones and older ones, sometimes for as little as a few hundred dollars, sometimes. But they nowadays go all the way up to over 50,000. If you get bells and whistles and computerized systems and so forth, they are an enormous investment or can be. So go into the process with some idea of where you want to be on that scale of price. And that will um, narrow down your choices quite a bit. For sure. Let's take a second to say hi to people chiming in. Oh, there's not very many of you yet. Um, let's see. Peggy and another Susan. Awesome. Donna. I'm in the market for a long arm, but currently have a sit down. Well, I hope some, some of these tips will be um, helpful for you and get you thinking um, along some tracks. So it'll, it'll be helpful. And Angela joining from Alberta, Canada, APQS owner times one year, Cassie in Cleveland. Awesome. Well, I'm glad you're chiming in and feel free to ask your questions throughout. If something that I say sparks a question in your mind, ask it. It takes a few seconds of delay for it to get through to me, but I'll try and answer them all before I go. Okay, talking about long arm prices and this enormous variety that is available from a few hundred dollars best case scenario for an older used machine to over 50,000 for some of the really high end new ones that are available now. You know, and within that, you need some sense too of, of why you're purchasing it, right? You're going to be at that lower end probably if you're looking for a hobby machine to do a few quilts of your own or your sister or your friends but maybe you're considering starting a business and maybe it's important to you that you can turn out a lot of quilts in short order, or maybe it's important to you that your machine can run at a high rate of speed. We'll talk about all these things as we go today, but those are going to be major factors in the price point. So knowing what your price point is and sort of your why will help you too to narrow that down. Also really high on the list of considerations is the size of the machine. So like physically, what size? What size of room do you have to put it in? What kind of square footage do you need? And actually other brands may do this, but I know that Bernina does for sure. They have like a kind of piece of flooring that you can roll out and it's actually got pictures, drawings on it of the machines to scale of all the sizes that they offer. And so you can roll that out on the floor in your room and say, yeah, this machine takes exactly this much space. And when you go to the websites of these manufacturers, um, they will often quote their machines at, you know, five feet or 10 feet or 13 feet. Don't take their word for that. Like actually go and find the specs for the machine. They'll be on their website too, but there will be specific inches. So Bernina's 11 foot machine, for example, is not exactly feet. I, I can't even remember off the top of my head how many inches, but you'll need to know those exact inches, especially if you're working in a tight space and need to have clearance. And then think too about 
whether you need to be able to move around all four sides of the machine and how far the machine you know pushes out away from you and how far it comes back you need plenty of clearance for all of that most long arm brands thread from the from the far side of the machine from where you stand to quilt i call that the back of the machine so in most cases you need to be able to get around to that back end Again, a Bernina feature that I particularly love is that it all threads from the front. So you actually don't have to physically go to the back side of the machine. Almost every machine will have the roll up um, system on one end. And often the computer is on that same end if indeed you have a computer. And sometimes the other end, then you can get away with having that snugly up against a wall and save yourself some space. So just that depends so much on the type of machine that you're looking for, but it might influence what machine you look for if you know what kind of space you have exactly in your quilting area. I know people actually who have um, taken off closet doors so that the machine can extend into a closet. I know multiple people who have given up a dining room table to set a long arm in their dining room or put one against the back of the couch in the living room. Like there's all kinds of creative ways to do it. So think outside the box, but you do need to know that space. And size wise too, you also want to consider your own personal size. The throat depth of the machine. So that's the distance from the needle to the back of the machine. And it's kind of how far out that machine will go and still quilt. I run a 24 inch and for me that's about as far as I can quilt and even the furthest edges are not the most comfortable. I save that for just when I'm trying to do one full block or something but most of my quilting I do just a little bit closer to me and if you're a short person a 24 inch might be just too long for you. There are bigger machines than 24 inch. I know Gamble does a 30 and maybe even a 36 which is just enormous. But it's really too long to quilt at arm's length. Those would be the type you'd use if you're always running a computerized system and the computer then has this huge pass, huge space that it can work on. So that's really industrial. Okay, let's see what comments we have before we go on to other things. Erin, Bobby, Pat, another Wendy, Paula, Linda, Sharon. Um, Beverly, I did buy a baby lock gallant because it's just for me and not for business just a five thousand dollar investment yep and that's so wise beverly like to know what you want right so i bet when you were thinking about that machine you probably mentally calculated okay i can send out x number of quilts to a long armor for so many dollars per quilt or i can invest in a machine and after x number of quilts for myself i've covered the cost of that machine so it could be a very wise investment and something else that you want to think about too, right now, long arm machines are holding their value extremely well. They have a resale value, much like a car does. But you know, sometimes they're more in demand, used ones, than others. Right now, used ones are particularly in demand. And so it seems like you can buy a machine and use it and use it and use it and then go and sell it and, and make back almost every dollar that you spent on it. So re keep that in mind too. There is a certain resale value. There's always something of value in that machine. They tend, especially the more industrial kind of mainstream brands, they're built for the long haul. They're not built like our washers and dryers are to peter out in two or three years. I know lots of people that have 25 year plus old machines and they're still going strong. So they're, they're generally built to last. And so they hold their value well in that way. Okay, Bobby, I have the same machine as Beverly. How long have you been using it? I'll let you guys chat. Deb in Brantford, Ontario. Teresa in Oklahoma. Kathy, Helen, Cassie. Great. Nice to see you all here. I'm not seeing questions yet, so I'm just going to keep chatting a few more minutes. So we've talked about overall price. We've talked about the size of the machine. Another important thing to consider, of course, is its features. You know, what features are important to you? When I bought my first one, eight, almost nine years ago now, there were still a lot of machines out there that did not have um, regulated stitch mode, especially because I was looking at used machines, which were even older, right? My first machine, I think, was built in 93. So we're talking 30 years ago now. So that was, you know, I had to consider, do I want stitch regulation or not? Now, more and more, you're seeing machines that do have that. It's kind of like air tilt and cruise in a car. It used to be an option, and now it's sort of in every car. 
but still there are machines that don't have it and they're also always less expensive. So do you need that stitch regulation? Consider that. But beyond that, there's lots of other features such as uh, channel locks, some that are only, you know, digital or, and some that are um, more mechanical like magnets. So, you know, is that a feature that you want? And then there could be extras like overhead lighting or hydraulic lifts, or even there's a hydraulic advance where you don't have to crank your quilt, but it, it um, has a motorized advance. I don't even know what the term is for that. I'm sorry, I've never had one, so I'm not sure what that's even called. Features like that. Then other features like I mentioned that my Bernina loads from the front end where most long arms load from the back end. That's a nice feature for me. Onboard bobbin winder or not, you know, having a separate one. Um, needle types. Most long arms require a round shanked needle. Another Bernina feature I love is that I can use sewing machine needles at it. Um, the feet that go on them. Different brands have different, they're, they're accessories just like they are for sewing machines. And some brands only have a few options and some brands have a bajillion options. So they might be couching feet, they might be ruler feet, they might be Oh gosh, there's a number, different different feet for, um, like for doing free motion quilting, different levels of visibility, U-shaped ones, round ones, uh, spoon-shaped ones, or cup ones. So all of those are, you know, do you have any idea what type of quilting you love and what kind of accessories you'll want? So think about that. Another big one that might not seem so obvious to you is the sound of the machine. And I highly recommend when you're looking at a long arm in general, but particularly when it comes to sound, I highly recommend going to some sort of um, quilt show where multiple brands are in the, you know, our vendors and trying out the different ones so that you can compare. You can literally listen to this brand and what does it sound like? And then listen to this brand and what does it sound like? Let me tell you, there's a big difference and I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus by calling brands here, but there's a massive difference. There are some that purr like Cadillacs and some that sound like threshing machines, seriously. <laughs> so I spend a fair bit of time at quilt fairs like presenting for Bernina and you can, you can literally perk up your ears and listen to the different machines as they're running and they all have different sounds. So it's something that you're going to be listening to for hours at a time. So that's going to matter to you, honestly. So experiment with that. And with that said, quilt shows are the best way to try out machines literally because you can walk from one to another and compare. Compare the features, compare the prices, compare maybe the service that's offered in your town. Like what kind of service can you get locally? What kind of maintenance is required? How much of it can you learn to do for yourself? But at this quilt show, you can talk to dealers um, and, and you can literally compare because you're right there and usually four or five brands are represented in any given quilt show. So it's a great opportunity for that. And those people are happy for you to drive them. That's what they're there for, for you to get a hold of those handlebars and drive them and, and test out the feel of them. I have also, um, at different times, I've gone into quilt shops and before I purchased my Bernina, I was looking at another brand and I knew a shop owner a little bit. And so I went to him and asked, would you mind if I came in and did a whole quilt on this machine? Um, he quilted four people. So he had a machine that was always running in his shop. And just to get that real solid feel of it, like how does it really work when you're basting the quilt or when you're advancing it? And then when you quilt on it for a long period of time. So I asked him, could I come and complete a whole quilt on it? He was happy for that. And I gave him a little something for it and everybody went away happy. But it's a good way to, to really get a sense for the machine. You know, if you've never quilted at a long arm before, you might not even know what to look for there. But for me, that was a great measuring stick to know if I liked the feel of that machine and how all those parts of the quilting process work together. Let me buzz back through comments. I have a bunch coming in here. Laura, I have a Kinique 19 that I enjoy for myself and do some free motion for others also. Definitely my happy place. Good. Debbie, I agree about the depth of the long arm. I have a 24 and I can just barely reach the back. You know, again, there's more factors in there, like the height of the machine plays into that too. But yeah, do consider it. If you're only five feet tall, do not invest in a 26 inch machine unless you have a computer to run it because you won't be able to reach the back. Um, Pat, I have the Kinique 15R on a Grace hoop frame, love it. Marsha, I just bought the Kinique Little Rebel with the computer system, haven't gotten it yet. Shauna, I have a baby lock coronet on a hoop. 
<clears throat> perfect for my apartment. See, you're, you're a person that says, yep, it can be done even in an apartment. Good for you. Good for you. There's always a way. There's always a way. Aaron just bought Echo Feet. Can't wait till they get here. Awesome. Jan from Georgia. Carolyn, I have a Kinique 21 Pro and love it. I'm worried about repair. You have to send it back to Utah as there aren't repair people anywhere else or at least near me. So far, so good. You know, that certainly is a consideration and I probably should emphasize it because it's something I hear a lot from people. They bought a new machine and then maybe they didn't receive hardly any training on it and they can't get someone to service it and what do they do now? So it's wise to look ahead at that. What kind of maintenance does it require? How much is available close to you? And like, what are the logistics? Can you haul the machine in? Do they come and get it? Do they come to your home? What are the things? And again, quite a few of the mainstream long arms, they're not a complicated machine, right? They only do a straight stitch. They're not a complex machine. So a lot of them have a number of service procedures that you can do yourself and YouTube being the wonderful thing that it is, you can often find out certainly how to oil and clean, but often how to do timing, um, how to change out small parts like maybe, uh, you know, thread holders, the, we call them little pigtails thread holders or tension springs, lots of those things you can do for yourself. And I've known quilters who have changed out things like motors and motherboards. Uh, my husband is one of them. He's done that for me. You know, with the help of our dealer, they were willing to walk us through it on a Zoom call. So get to know your dealer and get to know what kind of options like that are available for you because it really, really does matter down the road. Marsha, how often or ever do you take your long arm in for tune-up or cleaning? Do you just wait till something is wrong? Um, I do think that manufacturers have recommendations. Like for Bernina, they actually, when I bought my new one, they said, you know, it's so many stitches. That's when you should take it in. It's almost like almost like having your tires balanced, right? You've been running it for a while and now just go make sure everything is just touched up and, and, and adjusted correctly and then you should be good to go for a long time and that seems to be holding true. I have once taken my machine in to a store for servicing and I've twice hired someone to come to my home. I personally prefer, prefer having them come to my home. I just feel safer knowing my machine's not jostled about in my vehicle. I don't have a good way to transport it, right? So to me, it was worth that extra dollar. And then to they can see it on the frame and move it back and forth. If they take it to the store, they usually just bolt it to some type of countertop and work on the machine and then send it back to you. But then it has nothing to do with the movement on the rails, right? So if you're having problems moving from right to left, for example, they're not gonna be able to help you with that. They're not gonna be able to fine tune for that or suggest things you could do for that. So I like having them come to my home, personal preference. Um, but in general, Marsha, I do have to say, like cleaning and oiling and all those things I do myself, and I wouldn't do a servicing then. I wouldn't pay for servicing unless I was having a problem. If everything's running smoothly, just keep on going. Susan Swindle, for a new long arm, long armor, do you think the resources online are enough to allow you to learn from home? Um, I absolutely do. If you factor in the fact that there are lots of quilters, myself included, who have courses online. So they're not free necessarily, but there is a lot of free resources out there. And then once you know something specific that you want to learn, then there are courses available to buy. And there are lots of good long arm quilters out there offering material, both free on YouTube and then in the form of online courses. So absolutely, I think it's possible. I mean, I think most long armers learn by doing. I, I didn't take a single class and because my first machine was a used one from an individual, not even from a dealer, I had zero support when I bought it. So I just learned by tripping over things basically. And that's why I talk to you guys. I'm trying to save you some of those bruised knees. And in March, I bought a new Bernina on a five foot frame on sale. Highly recommend this brand. I'm happy to hear you say that. I have good things to say about Bernina too, but I don't, I don't want to pump up only one brand. There's, there's good qualities in all of them. There really is. Okay. Uh, Teresa, I have a Q20 sit down in my lounge room because I live in a unit. Good for you. Sean, it scares me to think of having my long arm in the car. It rather does for me too. And you know, I propped mine all up with pillows and, and braces and what have you. And, and it certainly is a possibility, but it's just a risky run. Anyway, you guys, we're at 20 minutes. 
and it's time for us to get on the road again. So I'm going to go one more time. I'd love if you give a thumbs up if you've enjoyed these episodes and share them with your friends as much as you can. Click the bell so you get notifications. And I will be back every single day for 30 days. So until the 27th of October with quilting related topics, feel free to email me if you have a topic you'd like to discuss. Info at stitchedbysusan.com. And let's see. Oh, a couple questions coming in. Susan, how do you evaluate whether a used machine is a good buy? And Quilty Linda is saying you get what you pay for. You know, true, although I've known people to get really sparkling good deals too. But to the Susan who asked, how do you evaluate whether it's a good buy? Um, number one is you literally could call a dealer and ask them. You know, you could say, I'm looking at this model, this old, this many stitches on it. What do you think is a range, a decent price? And another place that I is a good resource for question asking is Facebook groups because you'll get you'll hear from all kinds of owners in there and you'll get a million answers maybe only a hundred good ones out of that but it is a good place to ask questions and people will certainly chime in with you know my machine is x you know old and still worth this many dollars and it will help you to gauge that range of where a good buy is um yeah again when I bought my first one I was a bit on my own too and I was fortunate. I ended up with a really great machine that served me really well for over 700 quilts. So I was happy with that. But I certainly do think that buying a used one for your first machine is a great place to start because it's a lower commitment and investment. And until you figure out, you know, do I want a computerized machine or not? Like I figured out pretty soon, I, I, I didn't really care for that. Freehand was my thing. So I quilted for years without any kind of computer because that's what I loved. So I knew I didn't need to invest in that, right? So it just helps you to know, you know, do you quilt ultra, ultra king-sized quilts and you need the biggest possible machine or is a smaller one perfectly satisfactory? You do a lot of lap quilts. These things you just learn by starting and quilting. So a used machine is always a great option for starting. Okay, you guys, thanks so much for joining me today and I'll be back again tomorrow, hopefully in the morning Pacific time, whatever you're doing today. Make it a great one and I'll chat with you tomorrow.